release of your presence, Lord, on every one of our lives. Lord, that there will be breakthrough in each of our lives, in the depths of our hearts. Father, I even ask that, uh, Father, wherever we are, wherever we're going to be coming from tonight, I'm asking God that, that uh, Lord, you begin lifting, lifting the restraints and, um, and, Lord, not the restraints that might be happening in the world, but the restraints that we feel in the spirit. That, Lord, we would, we would carry the freedom and the joy of Jesus during this hour. Just be with us in a very powerful way, Lord. And tonight, Lord, I just ask for uh, incredible release, Lord, on people's lives. I pray for specific words, Father, from your spirit. I want to thank you, Lord, for the testimony that we have coming up tonight and, and just the, the stories of, of things that you are doing. Because that, that, is, that is the nature of our walk with you, is that we always have a story. We always have something to talk about with Jesus. And I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you know, to me, one of the, one of the keys, Carmi, hey, I see you. Can you see me? Got to give people the right names. There we go. Um, okay. So one of the things I was just going to share with you pretty quickly, um, just to kind of help you understand, you know, we've been talking very clearly about um, moving, uh, moving ahead with some stuff. Just, it's, it, it's time to get the boats ready. That's not next year. That's not five months from now. It's like now, now. Um, in, in South Africa, they have a very interesting statement. They can, you can say now, and that kind of means that um, it may happen in the in the next couple days or something like that. And, uh, and I really mean that. I wish, um, I wish Carmela was on here. No, not Carmela. Comela. Comela. Um, and, um, and so I, um, but with it, one of the things that, that um, happens there is you hear the word now, and if you're an American, basically what that means is it means you're going to uh, believe that they're about to do something right now. And so you think they're lying. They, they lie because it's not now. Uh, they never come through now. Um, but they actually have to say now, now. Uh, and now, now means now. Um, everything else is not now, now. It's sometime. We're going to get to it. And so one of the things that I'm finding out is that we often are not... Um, uh, how can I put it? We're not in a place where we, um, okay, we're going to, um, where we're, we're in a, a, a season of time where it's delay, delay, delay. Uh, everything in our lives right now feels delayed, but there are some things that are not delayed at all. And, um, and, you heard, you've heard me talk about the fact that we're going to be doing a, um, uh, beginning groups and things like that. Uh, and a lot of people are like, oh yeah, well, we'll get to that sometime. Um, no, no, Nancy, you can't have requests of my camera, <laughs> but, uh, but the, um, <laughs> that's hilarious. Um, but what happens is that we have a, um, a, we we have this. Woo, I got to get my my head together here. Hold on, guys. Just give me a second. There is something that the Lord wants us to do, and in doing it, at doing it, we have to um, do what He calls us to do. I've been talking to people about their. Okay, somebody is saying there's no volume. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, we can all hear. Okay, so. Um, if, if, if you could just respond to that, Chris, I don't know if you can, but that'd be great. Um, but what happens, and, uh, and don't address me, if you will, please. Um, you can address Chris with the questions right now, because I'm getting distracted with 
things popping up and I can't, I can't handle that. So, uh, <laughs> thanks, Sean. I appreciate it. I didn't say anything yet. Have you noticed? I mean, Sean just said to me, what did you say? <laughs> I'm like, I'm not. No, 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 no. We're done. <laughs> you, only three of you are laughing. I thought it was pretty funny, actually. So I'm, I'm quite human, by the way. I, you know, it's funny. I can't imagine how God works, you know. Can you imagine what, what his Zoom call looks like? <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, uh, no. <laughs> um, so there are things the Lord is saying to us, and he's saying, I want you to do it now. That's why I've been encouraging you, even in the instantaneous. You know, we've talked about the nuance of the Lord, that we respond to his nuance. We, we immediately obey. It's, he's looking for immediate obedience, and, and what that looks like is that the Lord gives you, it almost feels like a hunch, okay? That's, that's the best word I can, I can find that you might understand. You just have a hunch, and you go, okay, I'm going to do it. And you begin moving towards what God has called you to do. And, and the reason you do that is because uh, you, you have to um, continue in that obedient place, uh, People are wanting to break through in the Lord, but when they tell them to, tell them to do, do something, they don't do it. And then they wonder, you know, why doesn't God ever speak to me? It's like, it's not, it's not that God won't speak to you, but it's like, what are you going to do when God speaks to you? So the Lord spoke to us a few months ago, and he said, hey, I want you to begin focused on some, uh, you know, training people for underground. And one of the first facets of that was developing people to do home groups. And... Um, and so right now, I think we have, in October, uh, we've got eight different groups that are starting. Uh, this has basically happened over the last four to five weeks. Basically, boom, here we go. And um, uh, including a kid's one uh, that I get to do. I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, but some of you in the other regions, um, don't wait. You don't need to prepare anymore. You, you are prepared. It's just a matter of initiating and starting and inviting people in your home. It may be three the first time. Uh, that's not a big deal. It, that's how you begin. That's exactly how it begins. Uh, but as you begin, the Lord will, Lord will help you, uh, give you, give you the promptings. And I encourage people to get together, to work together. But the reason I'm saying this is because this right here, what we do right here, it's good. It's encouraging, we hope. But this is not really Christianity. This is not, this is not putting feet to it. Uh, in your prayer closet, that's not necessarily Christianity. It's okay. It's good. We should all do it. We should all pray. Obviously, the Bible teaches us to do that. Reading the Bible is good. But it's what I said to you a few weeks ago. I said, the meat is in the street. Wimber used to use that phrase all the, ter all the time. But the reality is, is that, that what God has called you to is intended to do. Jesus said, I am commissioning you to go and, and teach others what I've shown you what to do. So, so the, the calling on our lives is not so much to just communicate things, but it's like, I want to show you how to do this. And I, I want to get you doing it. And I want to leave you doing it. And you got to go do it with some other people as well. That everything is multiplication. Um, it's not just about delivering words. If I just deliver words, deliver words, we've been doing this for about 20 years right now. Uh, the church has, we, we, we have people that are professional deliverers deliverers and that's all they do they just deliver message after message after message and they're expecting hopefully people will just pick it up and once in a while they find a good one they go oh this guy can do that too this guy can do that too but it's not about equipping the few we we who are called and if you want to use the term fivefold if you want to use the term of apostle prophet evangelist pastor teacher if you we're not called to just equip apostles prophets pastors evangelists and teachers we're that's not the full call on our life actually the call on our life is to equip the body of Christ to function in those things which means it gets it gets the moms and the dads and the children and, and, and the people who are not called 
quote unquote, to uh, a full-time ministry status, if, if that's what they think is so important. They're not called to, to do uh, these uh, big meetings. They're just called to live life and work a job and bring the people that they know to Jesus. They're called to be good neighbors, that, that actually that is the call on our lives. And and one of the things that I've, I've realized is that so often what we've done, for 20 years we've done this, we have, we have had a few people who are incredibly good and gifted at certain things, but it's like they remain the gifted ones and nobody else gets to be developed and released in what God's called them to. I want you all released. I, I don't think you have to be a professional in, in professional ministry to do incredibly anointed, Holy Spirit-filled ministry. I think the Spirit of God wants to come all over you. And I don't, I don't care if you've known the Lord for uh, two weeks or you've known him for uh, 30 years, you get to do it. Uh, you get to do all the stuff. And so part of what we've been doing is we've been developing and, uh, and we've had, we've had a a group that we meet with, that's a closed group. I've never done that. But the Lord showed me what happened with, um, with um, um, Bob Jones back in his house way back. And I'm going to get to something in just a second that Bob actually shared with us. But, but the Lord um, showed me what, what happened. And I was invited into a group that was a closed group. And um, and it was in there that he developed things for me. He helped me understand. I couldn't even understand Bob Jones-isms. They were just strange. It was, he was the strangest prophet I'd ever, I'd ever met. But I had to learn, and I learned some things. I began growing in that. In fact, very interesting, this week, um, um, I'll be uh, doing a prophet's chamber with, um, with Bonnie Jones. And uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And, there's some really cool things that are coming up still. We, we just had Ron Campbell yesterday. I don't know if you all saw it, but I really encourage you to, to listen to that. And, and there's many, many more. And, and some of these are known, some are not known. But, um, but to me, they, are, they have functioned in it for a long period of time. Uh, my focus has always been, uh, I was asked once by, uh, who was it? Ken Fish. Ken Fish asked, he said, how do you get these different people into your conferences. I said, I said the, one I want, the ones I want to speak into the, into the life of Mo are fathers and mothers, people that, are, people that have, have, have gone through the mill, they've gone through the grind, they have history, they got scars, they got, they, they got things they've had to work through, they've had, had to process things in marriage and family and everything. I, they're the ones I really want to speak because uh, generally when I've had people that don't carry that, they might have a good word, but they're, but they don't have that part that is like, I love you. I will lay my life down for you. I will give everything to you in that process. And, and when I see that in people's lives, I go, that's who I love. That's, that's what I love. I, I love people um, that love people and particularly love the people that I'm going to put in front of them. I, I'm very careful with that. Um, not because I don't like everybody. I like everybody, but I just want to see that stuff happen. So, Bob Jones made this phrase, or said this phrase to us a number of years ago to Mo. And he said, the Lord came to him and he said, move, move, move. Three words, move, move, move. And the reality is, is that um, the kingdom of heaven moves. Um, that if it's not moving, if you're not moving, you're not moving with the king. The, the king moves. He, you know, the, the kingdom of heaven suffers. That's a movement term. Violence, that's a movement term. Um, and the, uh, the violent ones take it by force. There is a, a move thing. There's something that occurs in our lives with that move. And we have to have that move in order to accomplish it. So I'm speaking to all of those of you who may not be a part of this localized area, uh, people in New England, people in the South, people out West, uh, wherever you are. Um, I am encouraging you to begin engaging in some of these things that I've been talking about. Um, and uh, for those of you who just jumped on, uh, we were, we're going to release it and just 
uh, a few days, but, but there's about eight groups that we're starting just in the greater Hartford area. Um, we, haven't even, we haven't even touched into some of the air, other areas. Uh, and when I say greater Hartford, it, 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 it bumps up into, um, uh, into the Springfield area. Um, but we are gonna saturate, we're gonna saturate um, every area with, with these house churches if you want to call them that, and where people are meeting together, they're worshiping, they're loving Jesus, they're loving each other, and they have relationship with each other. If you do not have relationship with people, you honestly don't, you haven't experienced Christianity yet, because Christianity is not a meeting, Christianity is relationship. It's relationship with God, it's relationship with each other. Uh, we get to know each other, we get to be in each other's homes, we get to um, be real with each other, you get to see me at, at times where I am um, maybe not the prettiest guy in the world, and maybe, I, maybe I've even said some rude things to my wife, uh, and if Karen were on right now, she would tell you that that's actually true, that a couple times I have done that, more than a couple, and some of those things I've even done in meetings that have been really hurtful, and um, I've had to repent. I've had I have had to learn to 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 weep about some of the things where I've hurt her, or and and sometimes where I've hurt other people. Uh, that is called relationship. We learn that, and we walk together. We're family. So. Um, what we're going to do is just, just for a minute, Chris, you're there. If you could open the mic so people who are not on camera um, could turn their cameras on, it'd be great. We're going to turn all the mics on just for a second and take a few questions, and then I'm going to share something with you So, um, before we go any further. So here come your mics, I think. Can you do that, or do I have to do that? Uh, I'm looking for the choice. <laughs> So, 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 participants, they're they're allowed to unmute. Yeah, they're all allowed to unmute. Yep. Okay. We can unmute ourselves. Yep. There you go. All set. I just hit unmute all, but some people just remain muted, anyways. Really quickly, very quickly. Um, uh, any questions? Any comments regarding um, anything that um, we need to talk about tonight? Anybody? Sorry. Anybody? We're good. Don't have to and bop, uh, making sounds. Ah. We love him. He's one of the newest, the newest uh, family uh -huh. members. Sean, Sean, give me his name one more time. Kanan. Kanan. I knew, I knew it was something biblical, but I couldn't remember which one. But um. Yeah, okay. Sean, Sean's in San Francisco, in the ghost town. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, awesome. Okay. You know, I found out today, actually, that from someone in the government, they don't think that San Francisco is going to open up until March or April of next year. Wow. wow. Yep. Yeah. Is the airport closed? Airport's open, but if they have one more outbreak, they'll just have to shut it all back down. Wow. Oh. Okay, any questions? Let's. Nope. Okay, we're good. Well, then we're going to go ahead on. And um, I, I hope everybody heard me from, from in regards to what I just shared with you that Bob, uh, what Bob had shared, this is years ago, but it's something that I found to be very true. Um, I often will talk about the nuance. And people are like, what do you mean by the new one? Yeah. I mean, here's what I mean. When the Holy Spirit just gives you a subtle prompting or you have a sense, <clears throat> you think this is what needs to happen, you go for it. You, you don't question, do I do this or not? Do I plan it? Do I need to talk to somebody? I remember, I'll share, I'll share one story and then I'm going to go into what I was going to share and uh, maybe we'll have time for um, questions later on. But um, I was uh, in California a number of years ago, and I remember going to the airport. I had, I had to um, uh, pick somebody up from the airport, and um, there was crazy cloud cover um, and fog. 
I mean, so far you couldn't see anything like zero visibility. And so they shut every, they shut down all the planes and they said, uh, uh, nothing's coming in. And I'm sitting there and this is when you could actually go to the gate. This is th that far back, but you go to the, go to the gate and you're sitting there and I'm waiting for, um, it was a speaker that was coming in, but obviously he wasn't coming in because of, because of the fog. And as I'm sitting there, I was with a friend of mine. Um, I hear this inside. Danny, if you will stand up right now and shout loudly, fog in Jesus' name, leave, it will lift. Now, this is LAX, okay? This is like not, this is not your little podunk, um, tiny out of the way um, airport. This is like a large airport. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, and I met, I heard that nuance. And, and he, here's how I know that it was the Lord. Cause I've heard that same nuance since then, many, many, many times. And, and, and I know what happens when I listen to that nuance. And, but at that point in time, my friend was with me and I looked at him and I said, hey, I'm just hearing this. What do you think? And he said, no, nah, I don't think you're supposed to do it. And immediately my faith was crushed. And, and I did not have the faith to do it. I had the faith before then, but when he said that, I didn't. Let me encourage you. Do not discuss with anybody else what faith is telling you to do, or you will never do it. You will never see that person come out of a wheelchair. You will never see the deaf hear. You'll never see the blind eyes open. You will never see tumors leave. You will never see uh, fevers break. You will never see those things. If you question with a person next to you, do you think this is God or not? God is wanting you to function by faith. He's wanting you to step in. And so using that, going back to what I was sharing with you before, um, and there have been a couple of people that I know have, have, have come on recently. Just recently, the Lord spoke to us. He said, I want you to teach the church how to function in, in the underground. Uh, this is not my message, by the way, tonight. This is just something that, to me, this is extremely important right now. Um, that, that the Lord has called us uh, to, to teach, train, equip, and release people to function probably in what you were prophesied over a hundred years ago. You know, some of you were told, you're going to do this. Your house is going to be filled. God's going to have people in your home. God's going to use you for this. And you're prophesied over it. But now you're in a place where you're wondering, well, I yeah, I, really, am I, am, am, I, am I supposed to do this right now? I, I, you know, and we question it. And, and I believe that we're at a point where the Lord's just saying, no, go, 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 go. And we have to listen and we have to obey. And so we've got, I think, eight groups, maybe nine, um, that are getting ready to start right now. And literally, are you ready? That, that's probably on about five weeks notice for the longest of those. One of them, one or two of them have been going already. I can't, I, 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 but basically it's like, yes, we're going to do this. We're going for it. And, um, and we're going to go for it in every arena the Lord's called us to because it's time. It's just time. And, um, and, and we're getting shut down in every other regard. But the reality is, is that our homes are, are, are the places that, that God's presence is going to dwell in this hour. And so it's not about, it's not about the house. It's not about house churches. Um, that's what they will be, but it's always about, remember what I told you at the beginning, the underground is not about just doing a house church. The underground is about the instantaneous dependence on God. We depend on you for everything. So, you will depend on him for people coming. And that doesn't mean you won't say anything. It means that, that you're going to depend on him. You're not going to just go farm in, in the, the, the local church and bring all your church friends into your group, okay? Um, that's not where you're going to get your crops from. Uh, you're actually going to reach out to neighbors and colleagues and workers and people across the street and, and, um, 
and you know, I, I don't know if you heard the, the message, uh, the, the thing that Ron did last night, um, but he talked about going to a park and spending a whole day uh, with a man and his daughter or son, I can't remember, but um, the whole day, and, and it resulted in ministry. The reality is, is that God wants us to learn how to do those things and, and just begin to flow by the Spirit because God's up to some really cool stuff. So that's the now, now word. That's like move, move, okay? So those of you outside my area, I want you to know I'm going to be on your case about getting going, uh, not next year, uh, like October, okay? Beginning of October. You don't need time to prepare, to plan, to work it all out. The Holy Spirit has been planning this for 2,000 years. Your plans don't matter anyways. His will work, and uh, they're much better than ours. So begin moving in, the, in that direction. So there we go. Uh, okay, enough talk about that. Uh, I had asked if anybody had questions, and nobody had a question, so I'm assuming you guys are all brilliant. You got it all together. That's good. I, I have a question. Oh, Pamela. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, you said you were coming to our area, and do you know when and where? I don't. But, but one oh. of the things, my, I, I know that I'm going to be going south, and I, and I know that I have to go to Florida. And so I, really what I have to work out is I've got to work out um, – probably a few locations in the area to to make it really worth me coming and i just have to work on it i just i i haven't done it i need some people on the ground there in the past i've had a few people that have said yep we'll work on it we'll get it together uh, and so i would encourage you to contact even some of the other folks there and say hey let's let's figure this out my schedule's pretty wide open I mean, okay. I'm, probably, I'm probably not going to come there over Thanksgiving, and I'm probably not going to come over there over Christmas. So um, I'm, I'm just uh, yeah, just the, the practice. I don't part know of how soon. Because there's, um, there's a church we've been attending, uh, that, and several people there have said, bring Danny here. <laughs> well, talk then, to them. That, that'd be great. Know. I'd love to talk to you guys. So uh, I'll let you know, and we can make some connections with you. Good. That'd be great. I'd love it. It's Church, church on the Rock in Melbourne. Okay, good. Good, good, good. All right. Yeah. Cool. Can I ask a question? Oh. You can. Yes. So um, I was watching uh, something from Mo from way back when Bob had a word for Mo. Yeah. When he was talking about the, the quicksand and, and it was, I guess it was an early Mo meeting, but I don't know how long ago it was. It must have been seven ten years ago that that one was probably in 2008 maybe nine but probably eight yeah because you know you, you when you when you mentioned bob you know obviously when you listen to him he has a whole different dialect yep. a whole different yeah. way of sharing and yep. you know one of the things that i really took away from it was you know when you start working on the things for the Lord, then the attacks come. Yeah. And when you're in quicksand, you keep walking. I like that. That's right. And, and he also said, you know, stay with, with God vision, not what's going on around you. No, I'm sure you stay. Yeah. So it was just really good to hear. I just didn't know how long ago it was. And it was. It I, just, I think it was probably 2007. That's what I, I think that it, it could have been later than that. But um, was it a recording or was it video? I think it was a recording. It was a recording. Because that actually may have been 2010. It was a, it was a very, he said it was, it was a very anointed when he walked in, his eyes were burning. Do you remember that? that? It was 2007. It was 2007. 2007. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it just, you know, I mean, it's it, the relevance of, of then is now. Yeah. Like now, now. Oh, it is. Kind of. Yeah, one of, one of the things that, that we always have to understand is that sometimes prophetic words that are given are so out of time with when we think they're going to be fulfilled. And mm -hmm. uh, Kim Clement is huge, case in point. I mean, honestly, back when Kim, I'm, I'm just being really honest. Those of you who are in New England, you can shoot me later. But... Um, <laughs> But when Kim, when Kim would say things back when he was saying them, honestly, I, 
I really didn't give him the time of day. I missed it. I realized mm -hmm. that. But, but the reality is, is that to me, some of his words are the most specific, profound words that were ever made about the era that we're living in right now. And, uh, and so you have to realize that prophetic words are, are many times given way early there. And, you know, and sometimes even the person who is prophesying them thinks they're so valuable, they really try and push them. And they don't understand that that's not how prophetic words work. I mean, realize that when the Bible was written, <laughs> these guys were having words thousands of years before the time that it, it was not. And, and, I'm, and we don't carry that level of prophetic anointing. That's not, you know, our, our, our words are not scripture. And, and so it's, it's very important to understand understand that those things but but what you were saying um richard is that there's a the things and i i have recently posted some words um i in fact i posted the the bob words and there were some other words that were given by some others i posted them um uh, a number of years later because i was like this is now this is beginning to happen now and so those are very important that you, um, you understand that. And sometimes it's, it's those that carry us into the next, the next era. So I, um, yeah, that's a good, that was a good word that he had for us. Incidentally, just to let you know, I, I have opened up a lot, a lot of YouTubes that have been private. Um, mm. all, all of the Prophets Chamber YouTubes, this is like many of them that we went through Prophet's Chamber uh, with some of us uh, for a number of years, and I opened them all up, uh, made them public. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a lot of stuff up on our YouTube channel right now that's there. Uh, listen to it fast. You know, I heard some stuff from Chris Van Scoy that he, he just found out that's coming right now, where they basically, it looks like YouTube, I mean, this is like today. Uh, YouTube is going to try and limit access to certain certain videos because they're going to age uh, make them age specific. Um, if it mentions certain things, they're not going to include it. Uh, you won't be able to get into it, or you have to be an uh, you know an adult or or whatever. But and you have to prove your age. A bizarre stuff that's happening right now in our in our social media. So, um, anyways. I just, I just want to encourage you to do that. And uh, some of you who have ability, if there's something you hear that you really like, uh, you need to download it. Um, people are like, you don't mind. It's like, we have never minded. Uh, we have, we've always told people, please download. Um, uh, you can, and please share, please duplicate. Um, don't sell. We don't want you to sell. But we believe that, that the kingdom should be uh, given everywhere. So that's kind of where we are. All right. Wow. Just one more thing. Yeah, so, I'm sorry. Just one more thing. Um, yeah. the other, the, the, we had the opportunity to go see Sean in Orlando. Yeah. And it was, it was remarkable. Yeah. It just, it really was. The, the Holy Spirit was there. Everybody was pumped. It was great to be live. That's awesome. Yeah. Rain. Even in the rain, it great, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, we we went when he was here in Boston. It was a much smaller group, and actually, I'm not I'm not sure, but I I was looking at just from the video the the uh, the crowd on West Palm looked massive, but I imagine yeah. was it was it larger than Orlando? Yes, uh, it looked like it was a it, two or three times. It larger. was unbelievable how many people yeah. were there. God's doing stuff. And in fact, I know because friends of mine posted who are Catholic. So it brought out everybody. I mean, it just brought the body of Christ in a very powerful way. So we were, we were able to go with somebody from Mo, uh, Gina. Yeah. We went with her and took one of our friends. And then we were in a group of Mo. Come on. Just right there. It was we remarkable. Met, we met, other, we Mo. met other Mo people, you know, just in a small space of Isn't where that we awesome? were. It wow. was awesome. Yes. That's so awesome. cool. Uh, just one share. 
Hey, listen, I want to encourage you guys. Listen, God is up to stuff. And if you hide and you just don't engage in some of the things that are happening, uh, Jesus told Jerusalem, don't miss the day of your visitation. The reality is, is that you can miss things. And some, some of the things that are happening right now, you just don't want to miss. Uh, they're just, even though it's, it's a strange time to be around, God has never stopped moving. And he's moving right now. So I'm kind of excited about that. But um, so a few days ago, I was, the Lord turned me to, um, to Daniel. I was going to read it out of my Bible, but it's really dark in here. So I'm, I'm not, I'm going to go to my, my phone. And the Lord, the Lord has shown me in the past, he said, I'm going to raise up a Daniel, um, a Daniel 222 company. And um, Daniel 2.22 basically is um, where Daniel encounters the Lord giving him Nebuchadnezzar's dream. Um, And it's a very interesting thing because sometimes um, we we have cultivated, tell me your dream and I will interpret it for you. But a few years ago, the Lord said, I, Danny, I want you to press into a Daniel 2.22 um, relationship with me. And I said, well, what's that? And he took, took me to it. And I, I you, you know, it's, it's one thing if you're told something, it's one thing if you have information, but if you have no information, your dependence, and this is another dependency challenge, your dependence has to be on the Lord. Uh, You've got to understand that the only one who is going to be able to give me the answer that I need right now is going to be the Lord. I need the Lord. And um, particularly if you have nothing, you have nothing to go on. You have nothing to go by. And in in Daniel chapter 2, you know, Nebuchadnezzar has has these dreams. He's troubled by the dreams. He, he calls in his astrologers, his sorcerers, Chaldeans, to show him. And he was demanding of them things that for them were impossible. In the days to come, I want you to know, God is going to bring you into impossible situations. Impossible. And, and if you do not understand this now, because Daniel did understand this. Daniel understood some things. You know, the reality is, is that Daniel carried a degree of, of, of authority with the Lord. He spent time with the Lord. This is the guy who prayed even when he was told not to. This is the guy who, in the midst of a government that said, you're not allowed to pray. Hello? You're not allowed to do this. This is a guy who proceeded to open his window and pray, and everybody knew he prayed. He knew it would draw criticism, but it didn't matter because his primary call, as it is with ours, is to the Lord, not to the government. You need to hear that. That is, that is biblical. It is foundational. And God, God gets the first answer from us, not anybody else. And so Daniel has this kind of authority in his life. God's already done some things with him, you know, in, in, in the beginning uh, and with his fr- three friends. And he, he, he's going to go through some stuff. Later on, he would become one of the most apocalyptic um, hearers of what was to come that is even for our generation right now. That literally God trusted him because he was willing to step off the deep end, if you will, and say, I will, I will be the answer. I will stick my neck out. I could die, but I'm going to do it. And so the king said to them, I've dreamed a dream. My spirit was troubled to know the dream. Uh, the, and he spoke to them. Let me, let me get a different translation here because this is, I, I'm not going to do a whole bunch of these and thou's tonight. Just don't not feeling it. Um, I 
the rabbis couldn't do that. But anyways. Um, and they all said, may the king live forever. Tell your servants a dream. We'll interpret it. Let me explain something to you. You ready? We have developed a system in the church. And I realize for some, this may offend you a little bit. It's okay. I don't mind. Um, <clears throat> but we've developed a system in the church. Tell me your dream and I'll interpret it. Well, there's a part of that that's true. We can interpret dreams. I get it. But we have developed a whole ministry around that when, in fact, dream interpretation was very different. You might remember there was somebody before Daniel who had this same kind of, uh, of gift. Do you remember who that was? Joseph. Joseph had the exact same kind of gift with Pharaoh. And as a result, was able to tell Pharaoh his dreams and interpret it for him. And the Lord wants to give us that. In fact, tonight I'm asking that God's going to begin giving an impartation for you to know people's dreams. You go, how does that happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happens. Okay, so um, I'm on an airplane. I'm flying. Um, I'm trying to remember where I was flying on that occasion. I think I was actually going out to San Francisco on that occasion. And, um, and I sit in first class, I'm sitting next to a woman, and I think I told you a couple things about her in, in, a, in, a, in another story, because um, there were a number of things that happened to her, but I told you about her, um, her middle son and how he was sickly, and, and she said, I don't have a middle son. I said, yes, you do. I said, you miscarried your eldest. And she said, and she began weeping, and, and this is that same woman, I said, and, and I said, you had a, you've had this dream. And I told her her dream, explained her dream to her. And I said, in fact, you've had that in the last four days, you've had that same dream three times. And she said, how did you know that? I said, well, I don't know that. But I said, but my God knows that. And here's what he wants you to know from those dreams. And so there is a piece of that whole thing that, that God wants to give to us. He wants us to understand that. And so Daniel begins pressing in for that. And he says, Lord, show me more. Don't, you know, just keep, keep giving it. And he gets this dream and, and the astrologers don't. And the king is about ready to kill the astrologers. And most of us living in our world today, we would go, well, yeah, man, the, these are the demonic forces. Yeah, you want to get them out of the way. But Daniel doesn't feel that way. I'm going to bring something up to you. Proverbs actually says that God does not rejoice when the wicked perish. Did you know that? It's very interesting. This past week, we had, we had somebody who, who's probably responsible for millions of babies dying. And, and I, I watched the responses. I did not respond at all. But I watched the responses to different people's takes on it. Some were flat out, I'm glad she's gone. Others were like, how could she do that? Well, the reality is, is that God is not happy when the wicked perish. God wants to reach them. God wants to save them. That's what God wants to do. That God wants to prove that the cross was powerful enough to reach the lowliest, vilest sinner. That's God's heart. And, and we must always carry that heart in ministry. So even when it looks like we have, we have dusted the enemy, you know, we crushed his, his whole schemes that, that we come in and we go, no, 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 no. We carry the love of Jesus. And Daniel actually is the one who said, don't kill them. They, they, they couldn't have gotten this. There's no way they could have gotten this. But my God is different. So he comes and... Um, uh, verse 16, at this, at this, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. And Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And he urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this, ministry, uh, this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. And during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision. So when was the last time you had a vision that was actually somebody else's dream? How many of you ever even considered that maybe God will show you something about somebody else that is so real and so pertinent that actually it's not for you, it's for somebody else because it doesn't apply to you. 
you listen, you read, you go, that doesn't even mean anything to me. I, I, I don't know anything about this, but, but you come up to somebody and they're going through frustration in your life and you say, oh, and you, you ask the Lord, say, Lord, is there something you want me to, show, to show me for this person? Remember I told you a few weeks ago, I, I said, I dare you to ask the father, Lord, what are you doing with that person? I dare you. Because God speaks to his children. He will speak to you about them. He loves those people. He loves them more than you love them. He, in fact, you may not even like them, but he loves them. And so you ask him, Lord, show me something. Give me revelation on what is happening right now. I want to I wanna hear your voice. Daniel returned to his house. He does this. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven. And the Lord gives him this vision. And Daniel just immediately, now listen, here is the cool part that most of us, we, we don't stretch across this one. How many of us receive revelation and we thank God before we even know if it's right or not? You know, we're kind of like, I'm not sure it's the Lord. We, we live based upon the, the sense that what we hear is really wrong. We, we actually are more convinced that we can be deceived than we can receive truth from the Holy Spirit. We live under the notion that the devil is actually more powerful to release things to us than God is. We live under that part where we, where we don't really think that we can actually hear the God of heaven, even though we, we've memorized the verse that says, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. We read the Bible and we go, wow, I wish I could do that. And we read the Bible and we know that we've been saved just as they were, but we do not believe that God actually has his hand on our life like that. I remember it was a number of years ago, but I remember, uh, it's another John Wimber thing, but, but I remember him saying once, and I was so put off by it. He said, listen, guys, God is on me. And it sounded so arrogant. I thought, how can he say that? It would be probably 15 years later that I understood. God has entrusted the Holy Spirit to you. God is all over you. The very presence of God. I'm, I'm not talking about a spirit. I'm not talking about a, a nice feeling, but God himself has entrusted himself to you. He is all over you. God is going to fill you. He's going to anoint you. He's going to release his kingdom through you because he knows that he is on you. And the faithfulness of God is more powerful than the deception of the enemy. And I remember the first time I looked in the mirror at Danny, who had always wondered, God, will you ever really use me? God, will you ever do anything through me? And I remember the day I looked in the mirror and I went, God is all over you, Danny. And it was like at that moment, some things shifted for me. I began realizing it wasn't about Danny. It's never been about Danny. It's always been about Jesus. It's always been about the kingdom of God. But I began believing and taking confidence in the fact that God will release what he wants to release through my life. I have given him my life. Why, would, why wouldn't he? I have chosen to follow him. Why wouldn't he? I have learned to, to, to respond to, to the nuances. Not perfectly, but I've learned. I'm like, I will obey. I will, I will follow you to the ends of the world. I will, I will shut things down. And, and some of you know, you know, Julia would be one on, on this. She was there the night that I shut down the merge in, in South Carolina. And everybody thought I, 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 I shot and killed the ministry that, that God had called me to. There were people who were just like, you're an idiot. What did you do? There have been other people, I, I've shut things down. I've stopped them. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told me to. And people think it's idiotic, but it's like, no, 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 you don't understand. I am not in this for ministry. I'm not in this for me. I'm not in this for a name. I'm in this for the kingdom of God. And whatever he says 
is the most valuable thing, and I'll do that. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter if I look like an idiot. It doesn't matter if I go broke. Are you with me? But he's on me. And he's on you too. Daniel, after receiving the vision, immediately thanks God. He hasn't even figured out if the word's from God yet. That's pretty powerful. It's extremely powerful. And he prays, praise be. And, and in verse 22, it says this. Well, go to verse 21. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. God reveals the deep and hidden things. That's what he is. He reveals them. And he's going to reveal them to us. He goes on. He shares it with the king. And I'm, I'm getting to the part that I really want to get to for tonight. He shares it with the king that says, the king goes, whoa. Daniel basically says, don't execute these wise men. In verse 24. And um, they don't execute them. He shares the dream. Nebuchadnezzar begins worshiping God. I mean, it's crazy what happens as a result of, of somebody who believed that God would actually speak to him actually believe that he would have the answer. Wow. So then I want to I want to share this for, with with you because this is actually something that is happening. This is happening right now. Right now. And a part of this has to do with our DNA. People have constantly come to me they go what is mo? I posted something about that. I don't know if you read it, but what is mo? And um, people have wondered, you know, they come to a Tuesday night. They, we didn't have a Sunday. They go, well, are you a church? Uh, I've, had, I've had pastors here in New England. I've had pastors down south. Why don't you just start a church and call it Mountain of Worship? And um, people have pushed me to do that. But I haven't done it. You know why? Because I want people to understand that the church is not a building or a corporation or an entity that meets in a building, that the church is a people. And so people would come on a Tuesday night and they go, is this a church? And I go, well, I don't know, is it? People worship, Holy Spirit comes, people are taught, people learn, people are growing, people are being healed. People have learned how to become generous. I don't know. Is it? And they kind of go away wondering why I never answered their question. Because I want them to understand the bigger picture. What God is after right now is not making many clubs. He's after building his church. And incidentally, he's not, not into building men's churches. He's into building his church. And his church is quite unique. Quite unique. But Daniel has this encounter here. He shares the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has. And he says in verse 29, as your majesty was lying there, your mind turned to things to come. Now I want you to start thinking about what is happening. That Why on earth would God give an unbeliever an unbelieving ruler, a dream about future things? Well, partly because he was a part of it, but partly because he wanted to shift his attention into what God was doing and that God was in control, that God knew everything that was happening and knew everything that was going to happen. And I want you to know that God has given us an incredible blueprint for what's about to happen. And some of us are looking in the totally the wrong direction. Some of the churches, I don't know if you are, but I know that some are. They're looking in the wrong direction because God's about to do something huge. In this, verse 31, 
It says, your majesty looked and there before you stood a large statue, an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance. The head of the statue was made of pure gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of baked clay. And while you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were all broken up to pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. And this was, the wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory. In your hands, he has placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky and wherever they live, he's made you ruler over them all. You are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom and one of bronze will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything, as, and as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. And just as you saw that the feet and the toes are partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it even as you saw iron mixed with clay. And as the toes were partly iron and partly clay, so this kingdom will be partly strong and partly brittle. And just as you saw the iron mixed with baked clay, so the people will be a mixture and will not remain united any more than iron mixes with clay. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain but not by human hands, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. Mm -hmm. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true, and its interpretation is trustworthy. So there's a couple places I could take you right now, and uh, I'm going to. Um, I can find it. If you have a Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 2. And uh, when the Lord began showing me things regarding what he called me to and what he, he called it, he, he spoke first about it in 1987. And I saw a flat plain. And from that flat plain, a mountain grew, and it became huge. And it would, became volcanic, and it, it exploded and, and splattered across the region, across the nation, and around the world. And, um, and he said, this is, this is the mountain um, of the Lord. Later on in 2003, when I was um, in a worship set, um, I went into an open vision and I was in that same vision and the Lord spoke to me and he said, you haven't seen this yet, but you are about to. Now, mountain theology in the Old Testament is the same thing as kingdom theology in the New Testament. And let me just talk to you really quickly. I am not referring in any way, shape or form to the seven mountains that is being taught, okay? I wanna make clear that you understand that. I'm actually not a seven mountain guy. Um, when, when the seven mountains were, were, were spoken of, I went, 
my Bible doesn't speak so much about the seven mountains. My Bible speaks about the mountain of the Lord, the mountain that is the chief of all mountains. That in that day, it doesn't say people are going to be going to seven mountains. In that day, it says they're all going to be going, and we're going to read it in just a second here, to the mountain of the Lord. Jesus would recoin that word. He changed the word in the New Testament. You do not find that in the New Testament. Why? Because in the New Testament, he, used, he called it the kingdom of God. Uh, it, was, it was different. This mountain was very different. In fact, on this mountain, the water flows upstream. Uh, in this mountain, there is a, there's a release of the glory of God on this mountain, that there are the old and the young that we find out from, from some of the minor prophets who were in this place where the old would sit under their fig tree and the children would play. That, that is all con, uh, conjecturing what's happening on this mountain, that there's life on the mountain. There's actually, ready? There's life in the mountain. That it is, it is far more than what we know. And in Isaiah 2, um, and it's, it's recorded um, also in Habakkuk. Uh, in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of J Jacob. He will teach us his ways. Listen, you might remember at the beginning of the year, the Lord spoke to me and he said, Danny, the verse for this year is, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. If there's one thing we have witnessed on the earth right now, um, more so four years ago, we were all excited because for some reason, God united God's people to be able to make a decision. It wasn't really about the decision that was made. It was the reality that somehow God was able to rally people into a single decision and actually it was the righteous that triumphed. It was not necessarily the person who triumphed over. We, you got to put your head in the right place and understand what God has always worked through is his people. And that God is not looking for replacement for himself. In the church today, we actually have people who, who and they communicate this. It's very clear in church theology or church, whatever you want, ecclesiology, that is actually not biblical. But what they placed is, is go, the pastor is the head of the church. No, the pastor is not the head of the church. Jesus is the head of the, Holy, uh, of the church, and the Holy Spirit is the administrator of it. And it's all to the glory of the Father. That, that, that basically God allows certain gifted things to come about and be, be used to, to create the church that becomes fruitful, but it is not, they are not the head of it. God is. God has never abdicated his role. And he said, I will plant my church. He never abdicated, never stepped down and said, I need a couple pastors to lead this thing. Uh, we've been really bad at leading things. Ezekiel 34 talks about the fact that God wants, God wants his, his, uh, his, his people back. God, God wants the shepherds to relinquish, you know, his people that stop controlling the people. These are my people. They're not your people. And, and so there's been a war almost. And, and, and when messages like this come out, you know, people resisted like, oh, no, you're speaking against the church. It's like, no, I'm not speaking against the church. I'm speaking for the church, the church that Jesus wanted. And here it says, and the interesting thing is, is over the past year, we've had so much disunity, so much conflict, so much. And, and you see it. You see it in the church. You see it everywhere. Why? Because things are getting crushed. But forget the gold, forget the silver, forget the iron. We, we are down to the toes right now. And, and, it, and it's not united. It is divided. In fact, even with the, within the kingdoms, they're divided. And we see that all around the world. It, is, it doesn't matter if it's secular or religious. 
it is it is divided. There's divisions. Listen, there's divisions in even the even the cults in in the the false religions. There's division. Why? Because nobody knows the way. They don't know the truth. They don't know the life. Are you with me? But here he says he says many peoples will come and say, "Come, let us go to the mountain." Of the Lord. What he's what is happening in that one statement is he says, You ready for unity? You gotta put the right thing at the at the point where unity will happen. Jesus said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The reality is that we're trying to take people to Jesus, and Jesus said, If you'll just exalt me, they'll come running to me. I remember a number of years ago, you know, as a, as a pastor, and I and I'd study for hours the, the the word of God, and I mean, sometimes I'd, I'd spend forty to fifty hours a week just just for one message, and I don't do that anymore because I just don't do it anymore. But I used to, and and when when I would do that, um, I also developed my vocabulary, and it was it was insane. It was like nobody could really understand me because it was so out there. And my dad came one day to, um, to visit me at, at the church I was pastoring in, and evidently I'd used a bunch of eloquent out there. I, I literally had a book, you know. I think it was like 4,000 or 8,000 must words. And, I, you know, you start reading that thing, you kind of go, wow, these are crazy words, you know. And so you want to look important, so you read the words, and, and you, you start using the words, and then nobody understands you. And, um, and so that literally was happening to me. And my dad, after, the, after the, that day, I'd only been probably preaching for probably five years at that point, he said to me, he said, you know, Danny, all you really need to do is paint an incredible picture of Jesus and everybody will come running to him. And then he said to me, he said, I've learned to put the cookies on the bottom shelf where everybody can get them. From that day on, I have always been excited about six and seven and eight year olds coming up to me and going, that was awesome. I got it. Because if a child can't understand, cannot understand this kingdom, we miss the boat because Jesus said we got to become like a child. And what God has for us is so simple and so beautiful. And that Jesus, if he set up, will draw all men to himself. Our biggest task is not to try and create correct theology and great teachings our greatest task is to bring Jesus into the center of everything. He is the center of our world. He is the center of everything we believe in, everything that we want to show off, everything we want to talk about. You can tell who the kingdom people are because very quickly in their conversations, it turns to Jesus. It doesn't turn to gifts. It doesn't turn to prophecy. It doesn't turn to current events. It turns to Jesus. They want to talk about Jesus. You can find those, when you find those people, you know, they are just simply exalting Jesus, exalting Jesus. And, and it says, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the temple of the God of Jacob. It's incredible. He will teach us his ways. My ways are not like your ways. As the heavens are high, above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. That God, God has these things that where he says, I'm going to show you my ways and the only way to get into this kingdom is my way. Remember, he tells them, he says, some are going to try and enter through the broad way and, and some are going to try and crawl over the fence and some are going to try and get in every other way. But he says, no, you got to just come this one way. I got a simple way to come. This is the way you come. This is how you get in. This is the only way. I have the way. Let's go to the mountain. He will show us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And he said, the law will go out from Zion. You ready? This is the mount, mountain of the Lord. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the, but the mountain of the Lord was actually the same place that Abraham 
Abraham was commissioned by the Lord. He said, I want you to take your son, your only son, the one that you love. Think about that. God picked on some pretty hard things. I want you to take your son. I want you to take your off, offspring, that which, that which is your, your future, that which is, is basically the promises of God. I want you to take that. I want you to take the only one that you've got. I, in fact, I, so what I want you to do is I want you to take in totality what has been given to you, and I want you to offer that. And I want you to sacrifice it to me. And then he tells him, I want you to go to the region of Moriah. Very interesting. Most people don't read that part, but he, he didn't say go to, the, go to Mount Moriah. He said go to the region of Moriah. And when you get there, I will show you which mountain I want you on. So basically, the leading of God doesn't mean God's going to be 100%, 100% specific with you. He's just going to say, get up off your butt and start moving in that direction. You got to do something. Right now, right now you're a total failure because you're just sitting on your butt and you're not doing anything I've told you to do. Would you mind just getting up and moving somewhere? Are you with me? This is really how it works. And so you begin moving. And it says, when he got to the region of Moriah, God showed him that mountain, Mount Moriah. I want you to go to Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah would become the place of the Temple Mount, where the temple would be built. It's also known as the city of God, the mountain of the Lord. And he says that the law will come out of there. The law will come out of his presence. The law will come from him. The law, the law, and by law, you ready? The truth. I am the way. I am the truth. Are you with me? That there's, there, the truth is going to come from him. That the, some of the truth, I, I've told people, you know, the one you want to listen to, who's, who's your prophet supposed to be? Your prophet needs to be Jesus this year. Right now, the Lord wants you, you to understand you need to hear Jesus you don't need to hear all the pundits and everybody's conspiracy theory and everything else. You need to hear Jesus. Right now, you need to be led by Jesus. Holy Spirit, you need to lead us. You need to show us what you want us to do and, and stop being led, led around by everybody else. We need Jesus right now. He, not you, he will judge between the nations and will settle the disputes for many peoples. And, we'll, and they will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. You know what that's about? Do you know what you use plows for? Do you know what you use pruning hooks for? Harvest. You use them for harvest. He keeps going. You can, you can read all about it. But the thing that is going to bring peace on the earth is not government, not any government. That that rock that was cut, that God brought stress, great stress, onto the nations and the kingdoms of this world because he knew the kingdoms of this world will never produce what God has intended to produce. And those kingdoms will fall. But what will rise? A mountain. A mountain. That what God is doing, see, we, we think this guy, this guy, this this conspiracy, this thing, you know, we, we can blame Fauci, we can blame um Bill Gates, we can blame uh, government officials. We can, we, we can speak about, you know, this political party or, or, or this. Or, but, but when you start looking globally and you begin realizing, well, they don't have this over there. This, they've got a totally different kind of a government, but they're still going through this. And you begin realizing there is a rock not cut from human hands. Let him who boasts, I shared this the other day uh, with our team, 
you know, we don't want to be full of pride. We don't want to boast. But, but, but actually, the scripture says, let him who boasts. But it's not boasting. It's not boasting about, about us. And it's not boasting that you know everything. In fact, it says, but it says, let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows and understands me. I'm going, oh man, Lord, I, I've told enough people I, I don't understand what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, you know, I mean, I guess I've been in total error. He says, no, Danny. He said, that's not what I'm talking about. It is good to not know what you're doing. But here's what you understand about me. That I'm good, that I'm righteous, that I'm just, that I'm faithful. That all you need to know is who I am. That you know the disposition of God is good. That God is in control. God never jumped anywhere. And so we can give peace and hope to other people. That people who are discouraged around you, you go, oh no, I understand God. We're all right. We're going to be okay. We're going to be okay? Yeah. Why? Well, because God is good. He is righteous. He is just. God will bring about what he wants to bring about. There is no human that has the power to do what God is, is doing in this hour. People think humans are doing this. People think demons are doing this. But I want you to know that every demon in hell right now is sweating profusely because they understand that God really says the last word. That you know and you understand me, that I am the Lord. And I exercise righteousness and justice. The mountain of the Lord. You can't make, you can't make members of the mountain of the Lord. You can't conscript them to it. You can't tie them and drag them to it. You just, you, you just have to exalt Jesus. Yeah, they have to run to it. And the only way they're going to run to it is if they fall in love with Jesus. See, that's Old Testament, New Testament, the kingdom of God. The only way people are going to enter into the kingdom of God is when Jesus is the king, not us. I'll say that again. The only way people are going to run after the kingdom of God is when Jesus is king. Not our giftedness, not our anointing, not, not everything on us, not our ability to do anything, but when Jesus is king. And when Jesus is king, people will run to Jesus. And they're not going to look to you to be the answer. They're going to look to him to be the answer. And they're going to, they're going to stop asking you for words and start asking him for words. And they're going to stop asking you for prayer and start going to him and saying, God, heal me. And the reality is, is that that is the shift that God is, right, is doing in this moment right now on the earth. That, that he is, he's bringing people to the fact that there is one mountain, there's one kingdom. They're both one and the same. And the only one who rules over both is the Lord. And so we begin exalting the Lord. I want to encourage you this week with everybody, with everybody, with the most pagan, pagan, with the most religious, religious, with the most conspiratorial people, with whatever, begin exalting Jesus. Begin questioning, go, I wonder if Jesus knew about this conspiracy if he jumped off the throne. I wonder. I wonder if he's afraid. I wonder if God really rules or if Fauci does or Bill Gates or George Soros. I think God reigns. I think God reigns. I think he reigns in majesty. I think he's worthy of our worship. I I, I think that I think the election that's coming, God already knows the end from the beginning. <laughs> and I, I, I want to just sit with him from the end. If I can sit with him in heavenly places, maybe I can sit at the end place with him right now in the spirit and go, God, thank you that you've already answered this. This is so cool. We are here. Everybody's freaking out, but we already know it's all done. You, you had this all all completed a long time ago. And that really, it's not the frantic prayers of the saints that is trying to shift everything that you knew all along what was going to happen, God. 
Doesn't mean we're not, we're not supposed to pray. Doesn't mean any of those things. It just means that we have to understand that God is God. We do not serve a weak God that requires our energy and expertise and advice. We serve a God who has always been, will always be, and we will be with him. I think that's good news. I think that's amazing news. And the fact, you know, it's kind of cool. I mentioned Bob Jones at the beginning. I'll tell you this now for some of the, most of you have probably heard this, but you know, one day the Lord, uh, uh, the Lord spoke to me. Well, actually I was, I was in Nantucket um, and the Lord had given me a word about Nantucket and we were doing a conference there. And one morning I was there um, in a kitchen with, with about five of my team. And, and one of them said, Danny, um, what is a prototype? Because we've been given a word that, God would let us be a prototype ministry and that, uh, we, that uh, a prototype church is what, is what we were told by, um, um, yeah, I can't think of his name right now, Graham Cook, and uh, that I, we'd ask God to be a prototype and, and he was going to let us. And then he said, you know what a prototype is? A prototype is, is um, something that's never been done before. And so we had always quoted that it's something that's never been done before. It's never been done. And, uh, and so we knew that Mo was a prototype. And, and in those days, we, were, we, we had a website that was, we still have the website, but we don't use it. It's mountainofworship.com. And, um, and that weekend, as, as, as they asked me, they said, Danny, what, what, what does it mean to bring a prototype? And out of my mouth, I was going to say, well, it's, um, uh, it's something never been done before. Before I could say that, I said, it's an early rendering of something yet to come. That's what came out of my mouth. And I realized that's exactly right, that a prototype is simply something that will become discardable, that it's just an early rendering. It's something about what God is going to do that's bigger than what we have modeled and we've designed and try to figure things out. Later on that day, I was sitting in a restaurant. It was in Nantucket in the middle of the winter. And there were only two restaurants open in Nantucket at that time of year because there aren't that many people there. And so the place was packed. And I'm sitting there at the table. And this prophetic guy who was with us doing the conference turns to me and he said, I, he said the, Lord, the Lord is saying to you that, um, that the vision that you have for Mountain of Worship is, is too small. And I said, oh. And he put his hands on me and he said, it's the mountain. And at that moment, the Lord began, it, I was amping out in this restaurant. People were looking at me like, I mean, I was a wreck. I was a mess. Um, my chair is moving around. I'm just like, it was crazy. And people are wondering what's going on. And, um, and the Lord speaks to me. He says, Danny, it's the mountain. It's the mountain. It's the mountain of the Lord, Danny. It's the mountain. This is not about a mountain of worship. This is about the mountain of the Lord, Danny. And then he said, the mountain.org. Literally, I heard the Lord say, the mountain.org. I thought, that's weird. That's really strange. Well, later on, when I went back to um, my room, I, I, I went on the internet and I, I looked at the mountain.org and it was like, oh, it, nothing's there. I found out, I found out who owned it. And um, I realized, oh, I can't get this. So I contacted somebody to try and get it for me. And they said, yeah, we can get it. It's going to cost you about $100,000 to get. I went, oh, I can't afford $100,000 for a website. And I thought, well, I'm just going to write the guy. So I wrote the guy, gave my phone number. He called me back and he said, well, you know, he said, this is very interesting. Tell me about yourself. And, and he said, what do you want this for? And I told him, he said, you know, he said, I'm a Baptist pastor in Texas. And he said, I bought this thing about six years ago. I don't even know why I have it. And he said, I'd like you to have it. And um, literally within a couple hours, it was, it was transferred into my name. And um, I got home and Bob Jones had had an encounter with the Lord. 
And in that encounter, the Lord spoke to him and he called me. He said, Danny, I had an encounter with the Lord about you. I said, oh, I said, what was that? He said, the Lord spoke to me about what your purpose is in life and what you're for. And I said, what's that, Bob? And he said, the Lord spoke to me. He said that you are for the mountain, that you are for the mountain of the Lord. And that's your purpose. And I knew it. I knew it. And I knew it was not a small mountain. I knew it was massive. He kept telling me, but it, it's, it's not massive in a corporate sense and it's not massive in a, in a business sense. It's, it's massive because, because the vision of it is included in every one of you and so many more. That what God's called you to, he's going to see fulfilled, but it's going to be because you begin recognizing the spirit of God is on me. He has anointed me to preach good news to the poor he has called me to proclaim liberty to captives. He has called me to release the kingdom of God everywhere. That He's called you. This is for you. The vision of the mountain is not my vision. The vision of the mountain is God's vision. It's all over the book. It's all about the kingdom of God. It's all about literally being a part of, of drawing people to the affection of Jesus bringing them into the, the domain of, of, of him being king, him being Lord, him, him being honored. That it is really about every knee, every tongue, every tribe. It is, it is about wherever you are, that, that Jesus is absolutely exalted in your life in every way. That's what Jesus wants out of our lives. It's amazing. It's immense. It's much bigger than any, any one person could ever hold or articulate. It's vast. God thought it was big enough to show a pagan king, Nebuchadnezzar. He said, all these, all these things are coming. But at the end of it, the best show, the best deal, is this mountain. This mountain of the Lord. This place where God, God will receive honor and not men. Amen. Amen. It's good to be with you guys. Lord, I ask right now for people in this room. I ask, Lord, for what it is that you, you poured into me, Lord. I, I, I'm just asking you pour it into them in some way, shape, or form, Lord, that you impart something. That, Lord, inside of them, they would, they would, they would find a place of Jesus in their conversations, in their, in their heart, in their thoughts, day in, day out. Lord, I'm asking for release of your spirit, Lord. Wherever, wherever these are, wherever your kids are, Lord, there'll be a release of the kingdom of God such as they've never known in their entire life. Lord, that they themselves will know God is on me. God has anointed me. God has called me, that he's all over me, that we can release what God has given to us, that this is not, not something to play with that we release what you've given to us, Lord. And I just bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know if I want to, Chris, do I want to come to you or do I, I just want to go to David? Talk to me, Chris. Go to David, that's fine. Should I go to David? Yeah, yeah, go to him. David. Hey, man. So hey, David, Dave, David is in Sacramento, and he, um, I've heard his testimony, and it's amazing. And the reason, the reason I want to, I, I, I asked him specifically to come and share his testimony, because I believe it's, it's got to be something that um, is going to be a story that's going to be multiplied, a thousand million times over yes. in, in people's lives. I just, I just believe that there's a call of God uh, on David. I, and I, I love, I love not only the testimony, I love him. He's amazing. I just am so grateful for you and for carrying Jesus as you carry him, David. It's awesome. And we miss you. We, we need to have another, another uh, festival soon where we get to hang out and, all celebrate. I think the next one we have, we're probably gonna have people from everywhere because people are so like dying for 
uh, seeing something explode, but yeah, it'd be awesome. So go for it, David. All right, you guys. Um, well, my name's David. I'm a brother of you guys and uh, through the Mo District, and I just wanted to say um, right now is an absolute honor to be here uh, to share with you guys uh, my testimony uh, and how I found God. Uh, I'm sorry, I was, I was already right before all this just watching the worship because each song uh, that was being uh, uh, sang was, uh, it was my relationship walking with him. So it was already just building up to tonight. Like I just, uh, I really feel like things are going to get broken for some people and uh, uh, people are going to really, really receive uh, the message that I have for them. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and pray in real quick. Abba, Abba, Shema, Shema, Ruach, Ruach. Abba, I know that you are with us, you are a force, and that you are here. You are here right now. And as I call out to you, Abba, right here, right now, with every brother and sister that is joined on this network, I ask that you open up the heavens over each and every one of us right here, right now. And you pour out of the heavens your love your compassion, your wisdom, your grace, your knowledge, your forgiveness, mm. your knowledge, and your, your, your wisdom. And just tonight as I share, Father, I just ask that if there's anything that's stopping anyone from receiving the message tonight, Father, I ask that you would pull that. You would pull that from them and open them up completely to receive of what's going to be shared with them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Oof. All right, you guys. Uh, so, uh, yeah, my name is David Thompson. I was born and raised in Stockton, California. I'm half Irish and half Filipino. Uh, I grew up in a household where my mom, uh, my mom and dad used to argue a lot. My dad used to put hands on my mom a lot. He was a full blown alcoholic. Uh, my mom worked graveyard, and she just uh, she used to try to just do what she could to make ends meet. Uh, my mom would be working graveyard, and I would see my my dad cheating on my mom. You know, multiple women uh, would that would be at the house. Um, so growing up, and about the age of ten, my parents had split up. My parents had got divorced, and uh. I was going back and forth from my mom's and my dad's house uh, as they split up. And by the age of 15 in high school, uh, both of my parents had both moved off to the Philippines and left me behind. So I came home one day and my mother just told me, uh, you got to find a place to stay. We're moving to the Philippines and um, you need to find a new place to stay. So at the age of 15, they left. And I was homeless in Stockton, at the port of Stockton, where I used to fish for stripers, uh, striped bass, uh, as a means to just, uh, that was my hustle. I fished to survive, and I used to, I used to, I used to poach, poach fish and sell them. Uh, I was able to use friends, friends of mine's addresses to continue to go to school. So, uh, I still continued to go to school, even though that I was homeless, but I was kind of cow surfing at the time. And uh, in high school, I had met my uh, my children's mother, my my kid's mom, my high school sweetheart. And uh, we were together, we were together for about 10 years. 10 years, uh, we were married for two. And towards the end of, of, of our relationship, um, I had been hiding that I was an I was a I was a full blown addict. Um, from the age of twelve, actually, I had been introduced to uh, narcotics. So I was doing um back then it was crank, crank and smoking you know marijuana and uh, drinking. And uh, I had hid my addiction to using uh, narcotics from from my wife. Um, so. It got really bad uh, towards the end of our uh, of our marriage, to where uh, I had got hurt at work, snapped one of my ankles, so I was I was at home on bed rest, and uh, 
we were arguing and um, she ended up getting up and leaving and her family was really my family. Since my family had left me, I, uh, I grew into their family. And that they accepted me, and that was like my family that I held to my to my family, and I I just loved them so much because that's all that I had of uh, being a real family. And uh, during that time when they, uh, at that time when she had left, uh, I went through real, I went through a real. She left the house that we had just bought, and so for about three months, I don't. I, locked, I was in depression so bad that I locked myself in this house for three months. I, I locked all the windows. And for three months, I was basically trapped in this house, but I continued to work on this house. Like my family was still there, like how I, I was going to do when my family was there. Uh, I'm talking about sanding the floors, remodeling everything for my family to be there. Three months into it, and um, I just look at I look at the house and it's it's done, but I've been using drugs this whole time, and I was just alone. Everything that I lived for was gone, but I felt like I stood for my family. Everything was gone. Uh, we ended up deciding to sell the house. She wouldn't let me buy her out of the house. So I was forced to sell the house. And uh, after I sold the house, I had multiple girlfriends. That just I was just, you know, girl, woman after woman, uh, just trying to stay afloat. Uh, I gave everything over to her. My heart was so broken. I, just gave, I gave everything over to her, and I started over fresh. Um, from everything in the bank account to basically every all the material things we had also, just even the cars. I just kept my work truck to start over brand new. I didn't want my family not to have anything, you know. After that, uh I just continued to just downward spiral. I just uh, I started from from sniffing from sniffing crank to now crystal meth is out, and I'm I'm smoking crystal meth. You know, my life completely evolved around getting high. All I all I wanted to do to just black out and drown out from this world was get a high. I chased the next high, a circle among circles. Just surrounded and, and trapped by demons, you know. And um, in this experience, you know, start, you start to learn, like you learn that that uh, crystal meth is witchcraft and sorcery, potions, you know, like uh, the mind control that comes along with that. Also, I um, I ended up going all the way down to where I I ended up with a a, a woman that I was with, a witch. That I was, uh, I was with, and um, I was using with her. By this time, uh, my uh, my kids, my kids' mother, uh, she had found a, a another uh, a person that she was with also, and um, in my spiral, I was a very, I was a very violent man. I was a very, very violent man. I. Uh, I ended up squaring off with her boyfriend at the time, and I, I broke his jaw in front of my kids. And so uh, after that happened, out of fear because of the monster that I was, they ran. So their mom ran with the kids and the boyfriend, and they moved, um, changed phone numbers. I had no access to where she was, no connection to my kids. For five years, I went without seeing my kids, and I was going crazy. Uh, I downward spiraled to where I have. I was demonized. I was. Um, I heard voices in my head. You know, the voice of suicide. The voice of suicide. It's it's your own voice trying to talk you into doing things. The sound of it's just like your voice. Um, 
I was suicidal. I just, uh, I didn't care no more. So now after no girlfriends and being homeless on the streets of Stockton, I used to just walk my routes. And what's crazy is now that I think about it, when I was out there and, uh, and I was homeless, for some odd reason, my mom used to tell me when I was a kid, she would speak to me, but it was almost like in spirit. She would say, whenever you're in the hardest of times, head for high land. Always head for high land, and you'll be safe. So for some odd reason, when I was homeless out there, I always used to sleep on the school's roof. The school was called Victory School. And this is what's crazy, is the school was on the street that the school was on, Victory School, is on the Devil's Mountain, Mont Diablo in Stockton. And I used to sleep on top of that roof under the stars. And uh, I just, uh, from there I was just down the throat, like I was, I was, I was homeless. So I would just, I would, I, I connected with some old friends. A lot of my old friends were cartel. So like I said, I was an absolute monster. So by this time in my addiction, while I am also homeless, uh, friends of mine that I was uh, real close to from, um, from, from, from elementary school through junior high and high school, uh, that were connected to the cartel, I was uh, one of the runners, so I was a collector. I used to go to Spokane, and we have, they have properties up there where they have women that would uh, seduce drug dealers um, that would end up staying with the drug dealers uh, in these places that we would rent out and pay their rent for them, or that, that the cartel would pay their rent for them. And every six months, I'd go up there, and I'd kick in the door and pistol whip whoever and tie up. Tie up whoever was in there, and I'd rob them. And I'd come back to Stockton, and that's how I, I was at. That's how my life was. It wasn't life at all. It had come down to that, to that type of a lifestyle. And um. Uh, after not seeing my kids for so long, and, and the, the, I was demonized so bad that I would actually walk on the outskirts of Stockton into the farmland, and the voice, the voices in my head would tell me to go in the irrigation systems and dunk myself in there. I would walk and listen to these voices in the irrigation systems, and these voices used to just taunt me and tell me, no, you're not done. You gotta, you gotta dip your face in there and cover yourself with mud. So I would cover myself with mud in my face and my whole body. And I'd walk back into town and I'd get on the freeway. I'd walk opposite way on the freeway, just down the freeway, zombied out. And uh, it's just crazy how, I don't know why it's, it's just, God's divineness. I, I don't know why I would never get stopped or picked up or took into jail in, in those kind of moments when I when those things were happening. And uh, <clears throat> that's what I was doing. I was and I was you know I was sleeping in, in parks on the side of the uh, uh, on the side of the stadiums. So um, I I would have a certain route. I would go and uh, hustle up my money. I go to this dope house. And I get my dope, and I get high there, and I take off. Now, it's been five years since I, I have ever seen my kids. I go to the dope house to try to get high. When I go to the dope house for the first time ever, the door is open. The lights are on. Nobody's in there. And I walk in. And when I walked in, I felt this crazy peace that I haven't felt ever before come on me. And uh, I fell to my knees in the dope house, and I called out to God. At that time, I, I had no clue who God was. I said, God, if you're real, I just want you to kill me right now. Take me away because I have no reason to live. If I can't be with my family, I don't want to do this no more. 
and I cried myself to see. I remember just a puddle, of, a puddle of tears, and I was all so. And and I got up the next morning, and nobody was there again. And I walked out. I walked down the stoop of the staircase. I was just gonna go take off and go on my normal route. So I started to walk the way I normally do. I was gonna make a left, and then all of a sudden, I just hear this voice. This voice that was different, not like anything else. It was just, it was so, so calm, and it filled me with peace. It said, no, David, no, David, turn right, go that way. And so without thinking, I just, I walked up half a block, and I looked, and my kids were out there playing. My kids were out there playing in the front lawn. <laughs> God had answered my prayer. And I couldn't believe it at first because with all the drugs, I used to think I'd seen them everywhere. But I'd walk around and just run people down and kids. Like, I, thought, I always thought they were my kids. But those were my kids out there playing. And I just, I ran over there. And I, I remember a promise that I had said. I was like, God, if I, ever, if I ever have the opportunity to say I'm sorry because of everything to their mom, if you would give me that chance, I'd do it. And so when I see the kids, I ran up there. She was scared. She threw the kids. And, and there was a car that was parked outside. She threw my two daughters in there. And that car took off, and she ran in the house because she seen me coming. And uh, she locked the door, and she grabbed my son. And my son was a uh, – he just kept walking up to the window, touching the window with his hand. And uh, I would put my hand on the, on the window, and I was just like, son, it's me. I love you. I just want to be back in your life. I can remember his big old eyes just looking at me. She's screaming at him, get away, get away from the window, cussing at him. And he just wouldn't go away. He, he knew for some reason it was crazy. Like he knew it was me. And I was back. Um, from that moment, I left because she threatened to call the cops on me, but I was able to apologize. And she was scared, so I left. And I remember telling God, thank you. Like, you are real. You answered my prayer. You guys got to understand, for years I was going to this dope house, and my kids who had been missing were half a block away. God had them that close watching over when I was lost, and all I had to do was ask them, and he showed me where they were. Um, I just uh, from that point, I just remember telling God, like, I'll do whatever you, I'll do whatever I need to do to just get back to them or just whatever you want, I'll do. Uh, I had I have burned the bridge in my addiction with my sister. I hadn't talked to my sister in years. And all of a sudden, after I had just said that prayer, after I saw my kids, I'm walking, and then my sister's best friend sees me. And since your sister's been looking for you, your sister's been looking for you. And I got my, my sister's number from, from, from her. And I called my sister up. Now, when I talked to my sister, my sister told me that they had been praying for me. And that was foreign to me because we didn't grow up like that. You know, we were kids and baptized as Catholics. We didn't grow up praying. We knew nothing about praying. But she had told me that a pastor had been coming to their door saying that God keeps on telling him to come there and to pray to pray with them for whatever it is that they need prayer for. So he kept coming. Like for days, he kept coming and knocking. And finally, they let him in. And they asked for prayer for me. So they were actually interceding at my sister's house, praying for me this whole time that God was calling me in when I called out to him and he answered my prayers. 
at that time, so I was I didn't want to be homeless. I was like, so I don't want to be homeless. So I got it, got it, got to get off these streets. My sisters had told me on that conversation. I heard about a program in Sacramento called the Salvation Army Adult Rehabilitation Program. It's a Christian-based program. Uh, it's out there in six months. Are you willing to go? I had just told God, if you give me that, uh, if you could, I'll, I'll do whatever. She said that for the first time I was, uh, I actually cooperated with, with my sister. She was just like, like, this is crazy. Like, yeah, like no resistance. Yes, I'll go. So I got into that program. I did seven months and I graduated over there. And went into another program, which is Mather. Did two more years over there, all recovery based and and a work program. But while I was at, when I went to the Salvation Army, this is this is how God works. And He showed me that even with or without him, when it's up to me, He's always there. When I got into this program at the Salvation Army, the room that they put me in was right on top of the chapel, like how I used to sleep on top of the school. And I was learning about I was learning about Christ as my Lord and Savior. I was learning about God. He kept calling me in closer and closer. And um since then, uh at that time I was able to go to the courts, uh go to the courts, apologize to their mom uh during uh, mediation. When we sat in there, I apologized to their mom. And it's crazy because her lawyer uh, was somebody who was work, working the program steps who knew where I was coming from when I was uh, I was uh, making my amends to her and apologizing. They granted me a visitated, uh, visitation, supervised visitations with the kids. And then after that, I was able to get my kids back and be with my kids. So um, just uh, that's just his goodness, you guys. And since then, I've been, I've just been. It's all about him. Whatever he wants me to do, I'll do. He tells me to stay, I'll stay. I do want to read. Uh, I, I wanted to read this. Uh. uh Psalms 40 because it really just it really just explains my relationship with a uh, with him and uh, 40 is a, a joyful salvation so this is pretty much what it was that I went through and, and how he how he saved me it says I waited and waited and waited some more patiently knowing God would come through for me then at last he bent down and listened to my cry. He stooped down to lift me up out of danger from the desolate pit I was in, out of the muddy mess I had fallen into. Now he's lifted me up into a firm, secure place and steadied me while I walked along his ascending path. A new song for a new day rises up in me. Every time I think about how he breaks through for me, a static praise pours out my mouth until everyone hears how God has set me free. Many will see his miracles. They'll stand in awe of God and fall in love with him. Blessings after blessings come to those who love and trust the Lord. They will not fall away, for they refuse to listen to the lies of the crowd. O oh Lord, our God, no one can compare with you. Such wonderful works and miracles are all found with you. And you think of us all the time with your countless expressions of love, far exceeding our expectations. It's not sacrifices that really move your heart, burnt offerings, sin offerings. That's not what brings you joy. But when you open my ears and speak deeply to me, I become your willing servant. You're a prisoner of love for life. So I said, here I am. I'm coming to you as a sacrifice. For in, for in the prophetic scrolls of your book, you have written about me. I delight to fulfill your will. 
My God, your loving words are written upon the pages of my heart. I tell everyone everywhere the truth of your righteousness. And you know I haven't held back in telling the message to all. I don't keep it a secret or hide the truth. I preach of your faithfulness and kindness, proclaiming your extravagant love to the large crowd, uh, to the largest crowd I can find. So, Lord, don't hold back your love for the help. Your tender mercies from me, keep me in your truth, and let your compassion overflow to me no matter what I face. Evil surrounds me, problems greater than I can solve. Come one after another. Without you, I know I can't make it. My sins are so many. I'm so ashamed to lift my face to you, for my guilt grabs me and saves the soul. So everything before that, you guys, is just, it's everything it's been, and I can't imagine a life without, without Jesus. I can't imagine that. I just want to, I want to, I want to ask you guys all: Do you know Him as your waymaker? Do you know Him as your promise keeper? If you don't, you need to. That's how you know you got a real relationship with him. No. Oh, well, oh. Praise God. No. Oh. <sighs> Sorry, guys. No. It's all right, man. It's all right. That was that was excellent. Powerful, was excellent, David. Thank you. I could see the people there. Everybody shaking their heads and pumping fists and everything. Amen. Yeah. There's power in that testimony, David. Yeah. It's right in that word after. You know, when Danny was talking about that and then David's testimony, Danny was talking about being, <laughs> bringing that there. And then the other day, the guy with the identity, that's our identity. We bring that to places. We bring that hope. Like the, the Lord brought it, but now he knows that when he talks about that. Think of people listen. You got a powerful testimony. That's to change lives and set people free. And we all have that. But if we just are sharing it with, it's good to share it with each other because it encourages us. I love to hear that from people. But you have that to take with you out, out in the streets, out to people. The people need that. Now you've got his too. I, I know people. You could, I know a guy. You, uh, you think you're too far gone? No. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can save you. That's what we carry. That's all I was thinking about the whole time. You know, like, wow. Wow, you man. Guys yeah, you guys, I mean, literally, literally, I have voices that would, that would tell me to kill people. I would be behind somebody sitting on a computer, and the voices would be like, just choke them, you could kill them, you could drag them out to the car, and dump, just these crazy, but at those times when I would hear those voices, there'd be another voice saying, David, that's not you. So soft when the other voice is so crazy. David, that's not you. You know, I just, um, and since just drawn to him, no more voices. Uh, committed to, specifically, I, will, I love to go against witchcraft and sorcery. You know, exposing it. I just, uh, you know, I just, uh, yeah, that's that's what my life has just been, it's, it's, I'm committed to him, you know. He answers our prayers, guys. Yeah. Yes, he does. So Danny had to take off, but um, I think that's a powerful, that's powerful. We got some powerful time for ministry. Um, when we do our breakout, kind of share that stuff. Like you got that to share. You have that, your, your testimony. And it's not, you know, that that's his salvation story. Like, now he's got great. I know you got more testimonies of how the Lord's worked because of that after, because of what you carried out. So share those, encourage one another and pray for each other in the breakout groups, encourage them to go out and share that. Find people, find people to say that man, God, God frees addicts. I've seen it. And I know, I bet some of you know addicts, I guarantee it in new England, God frees that and breaks that. Yeah, and there's, there's so many things in this walk, too, so it's tough, you know. 
I'll go to I'll, every now and then. I'll, somebody will want me to go speak at a at a meeting, but, but I don't speak to death. Or I don't call myself. Hi, my name's David. I'm an, no, I'll never say I'm an addict. I'm a new creature. I'm a new creation. I am no longer that person's dead and gone. You know, um, you know, you start to learn uh, the truth and in, in the power of the tongue. You know. Amen. Amen. Do you have anything else, David? You want to share, or you want to minister before we um, go just, to group? Yeah, just um, anybody, anybody who's, if anybody's dealing with at this moment, uh, dealing at this moment with like, uh, if they feel distant, if they're feeling distant, they feel like uh, he's not moving, or you know they can't hear him, or you're not seeing him move, or. Mm. I just I want to challenge you guys to go back a little, a little. When I feel like that, what I do is I go back to that moment where I met him, where I know he was there as part of my testimony. Our God is in and out of time; He's not subject to it. You can go back in the past, and He's still, His presence is still there, right there, waiting for you to grab His hand again and walk right back out into a relationship. So ever if you if you're feeling like that if you feel as distant, go back in your mind, go back within yourself to where you where you know he was there, and talk to him right there and grab his hand and walk back out into where you're at. You know, there's no gap. There's no gap. He is in us. He's with us. So I just want to share that with you guys. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys. I'm gonna I'm gonna send us into our groups. So you guys know how that goes. Pray for each other. Share. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you so you much. Me. And uh, feel free to minister in the groups too. Awesome, yes. guys. Give me one second.